We live, we love, we serve. If, if, if you are new to FCBC, you're not going to get an introduction tonight. We don't introduce family. Amen. We are so glad tonight to have Pastor, the Reverend Dr. Willie Dwayne Francois with us on tonight. And we are grateful. Pastor Willie is one of, uh, one of considered the sons of this church, so to speak. Well, and we thank God. Well, I got also, there's another son of the church here tonight, the Reverend Dr. Johnnell Green, who's here with us on tonight. But we are so grateful. Pastor Willie is the new pastor-elect of the Fountain Baptist Church in Summit, New Jersey. Now, I got to tell you, Pastor Willie's installation is on April 27th at 11 a.m. We're going to get a bus of folk, and we're going to go out there and support Pastor Willie on that day as he is installed as the 17th pastor of the Fountain Baptist Church. Amen? Listen, we already know Pastor Willie got a word on tonight. And so do me a favor, extend your hand direction of Pastor Willie. God bless Pastor Willie. God use Pastor Willie. God touch me that I might receive a word from you. Amen. Have to is the day that the Lord has made we shall rejoice and be made glad in it if you're excited about being in worship this evening will you give God praise all over the building come on from the rising of the sun until the setting of the same our God is worthy of our praise and worthy of Worship. Anybody excited to be alive today? Amen. What a gift it is to be alive. Uh, we give honor to our ever living God for the spirit of life, but we also thank God for our pastor, Pastor Mike. Can we celebrate God for this brother, this gift? Uh, there are very few people, very few people, uh, I, I, I couldn't even name them, who've had a greater impact on my life. He's the single greatest impact on my theology. This place has been one of the greatest impacts on my ministry, and it's just good to be home. It's good to be home here at FCBC. Uh, always grateful to see my boss, the Reverend Dr. Lakeisha Walren the president of NYTS. Thank you for it. I've worked for both Walrens, and so I'm excited about that. They have, they have both given the young brother a job, and I could be broker, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful that, that your pastors have given me jobs over these years, and they have, they mean so much to me. They mean so much to me. I'm grateful to know them, grateful to be in a familial relationship with them, and grateful uh, to be back here to preach today. How y'all feeling? Good. So good, so good. There are so many friends that I have here uh, that I dare not call any names because of how many are, are here, but I'm so, so excited about the love that I feel in this, in this place. Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8, verse 6. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Genesis chapter 8, commencing at verse 6. Hear these words translated from Hebrew into English in the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible this way. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent out the raven. And it went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent out the dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set its foot and it returned to him, to the ark, 
for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put his hand, he put out his hand and took it and brought it into the ark with him. He waited another seven days. And again, he sent out the dove from the ark and the dove came back to him in the evening and there in its beak was the freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent out the dove and it did not return to him anymore. Verse 15, then God said to Noah, go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your son's wives with you, bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh. Verse 12 says, then he waited another seven days and sent out the dove and it did not return to him anymore. But time is ours to share this evening. I want to think on the thought one week at a time. One week at a time. Thank you for standing in reverence of the word. He waited another seven days and then sent out the dove. After experiencing barriers in the black publishing world in the 1930s due to a resistance to organic dialect of formerly enslaved black people, the book Barracoon, the, last, the story of the last black cargo, gives voice to the African, the cargo imported, imported from the western shores of Africa during the great ma'afa of global commodification and dehumanization of black bodies. Zora Neale Hurston writes this book, and when she writes this book, it does not see the light of day until recently because she decided to tell the story of black people in the voices of black people. Though the slave trade ended in 1807, in 1860, the, uh, there was a boat that ferried 120 Yoruba Africans to Alabama, including Kujo Lewis, who the book presumed to be the last, surviving, survi the last survivor of the slave trade. This book was not allowed to see the light of day because there were black people who were insecure about what it would mean for a book to be published that actually captured the nuances, the particularity of what it meant to speak black, so to speak. The book exposed the stories of the kidnapped, the trafficked, the enslaved, the whipped, the sold, the coerced, instead of telling the stories of kings and masters and the wealthy and politicians. This was the first book to actually be written that gave voice to what it really felt to live in a land of disorientation, a place where self-determination of black education was denied, a story of separation trauma, a story of the violence of the auction block and the disappointment of reparations being promised but denied. She models in this book for us that there is something courageous about being able to tell your story your way in a nation that's built on stolen land and stolen people. There's still a conspiracy among us for people to tell our stories for us. I know there are many of us who love this country, but the reality is that this country is not really a democracy. This country is a kleptocracy because it was built on stolen land from, from Native Americans and stolen people from the western shores of Africa. And she decided when she wrote this book that was denied being published, she decided that she was going to tell the story of black people in the voices of black people despite living in a country that wanted to tell the story of black people in a way that dehumanized, in a way that rejected, in a 
way that demonized, in a way that over-sexualized. And she decided to use the voices of black people to tell this story. I must say this in passing that we must be very clear that this country cannot be great until it finally decides to be morally good. And a country cannot be morally good if it is built on stolen land and stolen labor and is an organized conspiracy to steal the stories of people who have survived the most heinous, vicious violence that has ever been visited upon people in this world. She decided to tell the story of black people in the voices of black people. And my brothers and sisters, that ought to excite you because she invites us to be serious about what it means to tell our own story. There ought to be some people in here who can say, I'm so tired of people who believe they can speak my story for me and write my narrative for me. I don't need you telling my story in ways that don't honor my dignity, honor my creativity, honor my passion, honor my power, honor my possibilities, and honor my future. Am I looking at people today that can say, I'm so tired of people who think they can tell my story for me. I'm tired of church people who only want to talk about my so-called sins. I'm tired of employed people who only want to talk about those times I didn't have money. I'm so tired of rich people who always want to make me feel as if I'm lazy and shiftless. I'm so tired of married people who try to tell my story like I'm always after their boo, always after their content. Is there anybody in here that can say, I'm so tired of people trying to tell my story for me because I was created in the boldness and the fullness of an ever-living, ever-loving, ever-present, ever-creative God. And I know how to speak for myself because when you survive the stuff that I've climbed out of, when you survive the situations that other folk couldn't even dare to put their foot in, when you've been through what I've been through, I don't need you to tell my story because I know I'm a survivor. I know I'm a way maker. I know I'm a miracle worker. I know that's how y'all like to talk about God. But sometimes you got to look in the mirror and say, because I've been created by God, I'm a way maker. I'm a promise keeper. I am a miracle worker because I am a manifestation of a creative God. I wish somebody said I came today uh, to get the strength to tell my own story. Uh, don't put your mouth on me uh, if you've not survived the stuff uh, that I've had to press through. They didn't, they didn't publish this book for decades because they didn't think it represented or it should represent what it means to, to be black. But the reason why I bring this up is because in this book, Zora Neale Hurston writes a line that, that is accredited to one of the characters in the story, The Last Barracoon, the story of the last black cargo. In this book, she says that though the heart is breaking, happiness can exist in a moment because the moment in which we live is all the time there really is. So we might as well keep on going. Lord, I wish that landed for you the way it landed for me. Because when I think about uh, everything God is calling me to do, uh, I have to remind myself uh, that I can keep going one week at a time. Uh, because all I ever really have uh, is the moment in which I'm standing, uh, the moment in which I'm breathing. Uh, and I have to figure out uh, how to live the fullness uh, of who I am in every single moment. Uh, and so I cannot give up. Uh, I cannot turn around. Uh, I cannot back down. I cannot walk away because the moment that's in front of me is the only moment that I have. Can I get people that came to FCBC tonight that can say I might as well keep going because I still have breath. I might as well keep going because I still have a pulse. I might as well keep going because I still have a dream. I might as well keep going because I still have a prayer. Is there anybody in here that can say I could quit but I won't uh, because the moment I have right now is the only moment that I'm promised. After, after roughly a century in biblical years, 
Noah embarks on a ark that's commissioned by God to play an outsized role in reconstructing and repairing the world after an era of death. Noah built a big cypress boat that relied on the currents and the flood. It wasn't some self-propelling ship. This was a boat that required rain, that required floods, and those daunting years of growing and chopping and hammering and lifting contributed to Noah's survival and Noah was only able to survive what felt like life's worth, life's worse because he spent years chopping and growing and hammering and lifting for 100 years Noah was building a boat that he didn't even know if he would ever need for 100 years Noah built something that God said he needed but there was nothing in the moment that said it was necessary but I'm so great for the pre-work that I do as I head into crisis because the chopping and the hammering and the lifting and the nailing are contributing to the survival of some stuff. I don't know if it's coming or if I don't know it's coming. Am I looking at some folk in here today that can say some stuff came out of nowhere and because of the work that I did, I'm talking about the years you spent lifting and chopping and nailing and I wish there were some people that came to church uh, that said I'm prepared uh, for whatever comes my way uh, because every lift uh, and every chop uh, and every hammer uh, was building my spiritual uh, and my moral and emotional muscle uh, for me to endure uh, whatever life throws at me. Uh, am I talking to some folk in here today uh, that can say everything ain't God's fault. Uh, in fact, none of this stuff is God's fault uh, and none of this stuff is the devil's fault. Uh, sometimes life is life. Uh, I heard you past to say one day life be life and, uh, and when life lifes uh, you have to tell yourself uh, I've already been chopping, I've already been lifting, uh, I've already been hammering uh, I've already been working uh, and all the work I put in before today uh, is only preparation uh, for whatever life throws my way Am I talking to anybody? Do I have any hammer swinging uh, nail persons uh, in this place today uh, that can say, I don't want to go through the storm, uh, but I've been lifting long enough. Uh, I've been planting long enough. Uh, I've been sowing long enough. Uh, am I looking at some folk in the middle of a storm right now? Uh, and you have to remind yourself uh, every lift and every plant uh, and every hammer uh, that you put in before the day uh, was preparation. Okay, I know I'm taking too long. I gotta hurry. I gotta hurry. I gotta hurry. Oh, but I'm so grateful that in the middle of crisis, God honors when I just take it one week at a time. Whew, am I talking to some folk that can say, I don't know what I'm going to do next month. Uh, I just know this week uh, I'm going to give it everything I have. Uh, I can't tell you what I'm going to do in June. Uh, I don't know what September is going to look like, uh, but I know this week uh, I'm going to stand up straight. Uh, I'm going to put some steel in my back. Uh, I'm going to plant my feet uh, and I'm going to give it everything I have. Come here. One week at a time, when, when, when you take one week at a time, text teaches me that you can assess your survival instinct. <laughs> this blesses me in ways you can't see just yet. Uh, uh, when, when, when you learn how to take life one week at a time, you figure out that you're much more of a survivor than you thought you were. Okay, come here. Though it rains, for 40 consecutive days and nights. We remember that, don't we? The greatest disruption of Noah's world is not the rain that's falling from the sky. In fact, the text, if you go back to chapter 7, the story reads that what really creates the flood is not the rain falling from the sky. But what really creates the flood are the springs underneath the earth that start bursting out of nowhere. Oh, I wish I could preach this like I feel it. Feel, feel, like I feel it. Because we often think that it was the rain 
that they could see that created the problem, but it was really the undercurrent of water that they couldn't see that created the problem. Why am I telling you this today? Because you didn't just survive what you can see. You've been surviving some stuff uh, underneath your ship uh, that you cannot see. Uh, and you've been complaining uh, about all the rain hitting your life, uh, all the pain that you can see. Uh, but you need to remind yourself uh, you've survived some stuff uh, that you didn't know was coming, uh, that you didn't know was working on you, uh, that you didn't know was pulling you down. Uh, because you don't just survive what you can see. Uh, you've survived some stuff uh, that you cannot see. Uh, am I talking to anybody in here today uh, where you can thank God for the seen and unseen uh, that you pressed your way through? Uh, we think the flood was created uh, by the 40 days of rain, uh, but the text says all the waters from uh, the depths of the earth uh, started bursting uh, and it overtook the ship uh, and overtook the world. Uh, and that's powerful child of God uh, because the rain God told them they would experience, uh, they survived that. Uh, but also the stuff God never told them uh, they would experience. Uh, they also survived that too. Uh, can I say it again? Uh, they survived the rain they could see, uh, but they also survived uh, the burst underneath their situation uh, that they could not see. Uh, and somebody in here needs to know uh, that you've been surviving more uh, than you think you've been surviving uh, because underneath all of our problems uh, are some more problems uh, that we haven't even factored in. Uh, there's the problem that's presenting uh, and then there's that other current of problem uh, that's also trying uh, to tear us down uh, and splinter our faith uh, and diminish our spirit uh, and crack open our courage uh, and destroy uh, our commitment to God. Uh, but when you look in the mirror tonight, uh, you need to tell yourself uh, you survived what you thought you survived, uh, but you also survived some stuff uh, that you haven't even started calculating yet. Uh, that's the true survival instinct uh, of the faithful uh, that you have to tell yourself uh, that you are a radically uh, adaptable human being uh, because you survived the stuff you know and the stuff you don't know. Uh, that's why the old saints used to thank God uh, that they survived danger seen uh, and unseen uh, because there's some undercurrents uh, that are trying to take you out too. Uh, but you need to remind yourself uh, you're surviving that too. Uh, am I talking to anybody in here today uh, that you didn't just survive the divorce. Uh, you survived what was underneath the divorce. Uh, you didn't just survive the regret. Uh, you survived what was underneath the regret. Uh, you didn't just survive the bankruptcy. Uh, you survived what was underneath the bankruptcy. Uh, you didn't just survive the termination. Uh, you survived what was underneath the termination. Uh, you didn't just survive the addiction. Uh, you survived what was underneath the addiction. Uh, I wish you would tap yourself on the shoulder and remind yourself uh, that you're a multi-crisis survivor. Uh, that you know how to multitask pain uh, and multitask predicaments uh, and multitask problems uh, and multitask crises. Uh, I wish somebody would look at the mirror tonight uh, and say, I'm surviving more than I see. Uh, I didn't just survive breakup. Uh, I survived all the mess underneath the relationship. Uh, I didn't just survive a dead dream. Uh, I survived everything that told me I was nothing and couldn't be nothing and didn't deserve anything. Uh, are there any multi-crisis survivors uh, in this church today uh, that can say, I'm not just surviving what I can see. Uh, I'm surviving what's underneath the crisis. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. There's some stuff underneath your life you haven't paid attention to, and you've just been surviving. You've been waking up. You've been clocking in and clocking out. You've been building your dreams. You've been building your home. You've been breathing life into your family. The whole time, some stuff underneath your life has been trying to take you out. <laughs> and it couldn't. This is why, this is why Ben Failer says in his book called Life Quakes is that all of us go through some traumatic transitions. About every 12 to 18 months, your life shakes in ways where things will never be the same. Am I talking to some people 
who've ever had some situations higher on the rector scale than you actually thought you were going through. I need somebody that can say, I've been surviving all kinds of disruptions. I'm talking about the mind-numbing instability, the hope-fleeting insecurity, the reality-prolonging insanity. When you look at me, you are looking at somebody whose life has been shaken to the core, and yet I came out singing. I came out praying. I came out rejoicing I came out worshiping a debilitating car accident that'll shake your life a money devouring decision that'll shake your life a breath snatching diagnosis that'll shake your life an alienating empty nesting that'll shake your life but somebody in here ought to be grateful that when the life started shaking God helped you catch your balance and what you are a survivor of is not just the rain you can see it's the undercurrent of chaos that you can't see all right I gotta push I gotta push not only not only not only do you when you take it one week at a time do you assess your survival instincts but Pastor John L when you take it one week at a time you advance your sustained investments There's so much you've already poured into this that it would be criminal for you to stop fighting now. (laughs) I have a funny feeling and a sneaky suspicion that I'm looking at some people who put too much into getting to where you are today for you to just throw it away uh, walk away uh, and not see it through uh, because the fight in you uh, has to be willing to say to yourself uh, that you've already done too much uh, to walk away today okay I know this is FCBC I gotta show it to you in Texas there's no better exegete in the country than Pastor Mike I get it I get it Uh, Noah and his family and the animals they spent more than a year sheltering in place. Now I know some of us have gone to vacation Bible school or Sunday school and they told us that Noah was in the ark for just 40 days. That's what they want us to believe. They, believe, they want us to believe Noah was in the ark for 40 days. But when you look at this more carefully you will find out that Noah was in the ark with his family for about 370 days. That's more than a year. Here, the rain fell for 40 days. The water emerged for 110 days. The water started receding for 150 days. And then the the remaining water didn't go away for another 70 days. Okay, I'm going to say that one more time. It may not be important to you, but somebody may want to pass this on. Because what they taught us in Sunday school ain't true. It rained for 40 days. Then they spent another 110 days watching the water come from beneath. And then they spent 150 days uh, watching the water go back down. Uh, and the, all the water didn't go away uh, until after 70 more days. Uh, Noah spent more than a year uh, walking the hallways uh, of that ancient cruise liner. No doubt with spiritual impatience, draining disappointment, and emotional fatigue uh, for 370 days. Uh, Mo- Noah waited uh, to see if God would do something more than the rain and the torrent. Uh, For 370 days, uh, he had to live with a word uh, that God had not yet fulfilled. Uh, That's why I don't give up too quickly uh, because I have prepared too long uh, and too hard uh, for me to give up now uh, because of one year uh, of crisis. Uh, I need you to hear this. Uh, He took a hundred years to build what he only needed for one year (laughs) did y'all hear what I just said he spent 100 years building what he only needed for one year and after putting in 101 years of waiting and praying and studying and building and planting why am I going to give up on everything I've been investing in because of one year of delay and one year of heartbreak and one year of regret am I looking at some folk in here today that 
back and say, it's been less than 100 years, uh, but I put too much work uh, to get to where I am today, uh, to throw it away for over one year. Uh, God doesn't always speak uh, when we want God to speak, uh, but you need to trust your labor uh, when you can't find your Lord, uh, and you've worked too old. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, you better trust your labor uh, when you can't find your Lord, uh, because you've worked too hard uh, to survive uh, this far in the process. Am I talking to anybody that came to the FCPC space today uh, that you've already worked too hard to give up now? Uh, uh, 370 days. They were waiting on God. But they had already put 100 years into get, in biblical years to get them to where they are today. I need you to hear this. We've already survived 405 years of American racism. You better not give up now. Women have already survived more than a thousand years uh, of being second class this and that. And you have a Supreme Court that wants to tell you what you can do with your body. You don't have time to stop fighting now. We've been living for 50 years uh, under mass incarceration, stop and frisk, uh, broken windows, uh, where they've been snatching our children out of school uh, and throwing them up against walls. Uh, we were hanging from lynching trees uh, on southern trees like strange fruit. Uh, all the stuff we've survived thus far, it's criminal for us to stop fighting now simply because we've been waiting too long. I need you to hear this. Miss Joyce, it's too late for you to give up. Whew. Because you've worked too hard to get to where you are right now. Somebody needs to tap themselves on the shoulder and say, it's too late to give up. If I was going to give up, I should have done that year one. I should have done that month one. I should have done that after the first mistake. Oh, but if I made it this far, I've invested too much tear and too much sweat and too much prayer and too much fasting and too much hard work for me to give up right now. After 300, after over 300 days of little to no progress, 300 days of stagnation and unclarity, 300 days of being walled in with filth and stench, something in Noah said, reach for a dove, open a window and release it. Did y'all hear what I just said? After a year of being walled in with filth, something in Noah said grab a dove open a window and release it while he was still in the middle of the crisis he opened a window grabbed a dove and released it <laughs> and then the text says the dove came back he waited a week and you know what he did after that week he opened the window grabbed the dove and released it and then another week came and you know what he did he opened the window grabbed the dove and release it I need somebody to hear that right now because child of God I know it seems ordinary uh, but the things you do on a daily basis uh, are really a testament of your faith uh, because doubt uh, does not make you faithless uh, but when you learn to do it with doubts uh, that's what makes you faithful uh, you have to learn how to open up windows with doubt uh, you have to grab your doves with doubt uh, you have to release your doves with doubt uh, because faith uh, is learning how to do it with doubts. Uh, I wish somebody came to church uh, with window opening, uh, dove releasing faith uh, that you can say in the middle of my crisis, uh, I'm going to open a window uh, and release a dove. Uh, do I have any op window opening, uh, dove releasing disciples in here today uh, that can say every time I go for an annual checkup, uh, I'm opening a window uh, and releasing a dove. Uh, every time 
time I apply for another job, I'm opening a window and releasing the dove. Every time I walk into FCBC, I'm opening a window and releasing a dove. Every time the check is short, I'm opening a window and releasing a dove. Every time I go to chemo, I'm opening a window and releasing the dove. Every time I cook for my family, I'm opening a window and releasing a dove. I wish I had some window opening. Dove releasing worshipers that can say, I don't know when it's going to happen, but every single week, I'm going to open a window and release a dove because if God be for me, it does not matter what comes up against me. Can I get some window opening? Dove releasing disciples at the first Corinthian church that can say in the middle of crisis, I'm going to open a window and release a dove. When my heart is shattered, I'm going to open a window and release a dove. When things are not working right, I'm going to open a window and release a dove. When the executive says my project is too small, I'm going to open a window and release a dove. When my family is instigating mess, I'm going to open a window and release a dove. Because every day I show up for life, God is taking the water down just a little bit more. Can I get somebody in here today that can say every day I wake up, I'm one day closer to where God wants me to be. And this week, next week, and every week after, you have to celebrate almost there. You have to celebrate one step closer, one week closer, one day closer, one experience closer, one better than it was closer, one resume closer, one interview closer, one application closer, one chemo visit closer. Do I have any window opening? Dove releasing disciples that can say every day I wake up, I'm going to tell myself today might be the day. Today might be the day for joy. Today might be the day for love. Today may be the day for employment. Today may be the day for peace. Today may be the day for holiness. Whatever holiness is. I need somebody in church tonight that can say, I woke up today one day closer. Okay. I'm done, Pastor. I'm not taking too long. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You can make it one week at a time because you assess your survival instincts. You advance your sustained investments. But finally, you can acknowledge your sufficient impact. What you've already done is enough to celebrate. Whoo, thank you, Jesus. Did y'all hear what I just said? What you were able to do under the pressure and the threats and the insufficiencies and the insecurity and the vulnerability that you've already been under, you need to tell yourself I've already done enough if nobody gives me a plaque if nobody writes me another check, if nobody calls me back for an audition I've already done enough because what I've done was sufficient Okay, pastor, pastor let me, let, okay Y'all heard that last verse I read? It said, then God said to Noah, go out of the ark. You, your wife, your sons, and your sons' wives with you. And bring out with you every living thing that you brought in with you. God does not say, well done, because you produced during the crisis. God says, well done, because you preserved what you went in with. And sometimes the assignment uh, is not productivity. Uh, sometimes the assignment uh, is preservation. 
And I need some folk at FCBC uh, that can say it's a miracle uh, that I preserve my sanity. Uh, it's a miracle uh, I preserve my dream. Uh, it's a miracle uh, I preserve my faith. Uh, I wasn't called to produce in this season. Uh, I was called to preserve. Uh, and you need to tell all those people uh, who say you didn't meet your quota. Uh, you didn't send enough emails. Uh, you didn't go on enough auditions. Uh, you didn't do enough of this enough of that uh, maybe you need to tell them baby uh, God didn't call me to produce in this uh, God called me to preserve uh, and I'm grateful for everything uh, that I did not lose uh, in a period of loss uh, in a time of death uh, can I get some folk in this church uh, that can thank God for preservation uh, that can thank God you still have what you had uh, you didn't do enough according to them uh, but they just want to take advantage of your labor anyway they just want to exploit your kindness anyway they just want to demean your investment anyway and you got to tell them I'm not a human doing I'm a human being and I am enough because greater is God that is in me than anything that's in the world do I have any human beings in the house today Come on, where are the human beings in the house today? You need to turn in your to-do list uh, and pick up a to-be list. Uh, be more patient. Uh, be more loving. Uh, be more courageous. Uh, be more introspective. Uh, be more playful. Uh, be more of who God wants you to be. Uh, and stop producing for folk uh, who don't care about your health anyway. Uh, who don't care about your longevity anyway. Uh, because greater is God that sees me uh, than anything that's trying to extract from me. Okay, I'm done. I'm done. What you've done is enough. And to be clear, what you've been through should have killed you. I'm in the text, Pastor Mike, because for a whole year, they were living in a context of feces and a context where they should have gotten sick because they had nowhere to get rid of the waste of the animals that you had to feed some animals in the morning, some animals in the afternoon, and some in the evening, which means they didn't even get enough sleep. In the middle of a context of sickness and sleeplessness, you still survived. And if you can celebrate your survival, then you ought to tell yourself you've already done enough. Can I get five people in this sanctuary that can thank God that you are a miracle and you've already done enough. You've already built enough. You've already wrote enough. You've already tweeted enough. You've already posted enough. You've already created enough content. You need to tell yourself it's enough that you even got here today because you should have died from sickness or sleeplessness uh, but the preservation of God uh, when you preserve what God gives you uh, God will preserve you <laughs> I'm done y'all may the Lord kiss you real well tonight uh, but anybody grateful for the stuff you survived uh, that you know you shouldn't have survived uh, then you ought to lift up your hands uh, throw your head back uh, and shout hallelujah I said shout hallelujah. Okay, I'm done. I'm done. Don't sit down. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I promise. I promise I'm done. Uh, but but, but I got to tell you this story. I got to tell you this story. Uh, pastor, a couple of years ago, I flew out of LaGuardia to go home to Texas for Christmas. Pastor Lakeisha and I are from the same city. I, I was going back home for Christmas. Uh, before they renovated uh, Terminal B at LGA, uh, you might as well fly out of Afghanistan the way that airport looked. Uh, I hate flying out of LaGuardia. I, I, I promise I did. Uh, but, but this one time I'm flying out of LaGuardia and I get on the plane. I put earphones in my ear because I don't like people talking to me when I'm on planes. I'm not listening to anything. I just don't feel like talking. And there's a brother sitting next to me. It's one of those two-seaters. There's a brother sitting next to me. And he's just looking out the window as we are taxiing and taking off. And he just keeps saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus. I'm ignoring him because I don't want to tap into that story just yet. But the whole time we're taking off, he's going, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, he looks over at me. He says, uh, you're not going to ask me why I'm saying thank you, Jesus? Uh, I said, no, I really wasn't. Uh, and he just kept saying, well, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, I said, okay, brother, tell me why you keep saying thank you, Jesus. Uh, he said, are you a believer? I said, I follow Jesus. I follow the carpenter. And he just keeps saying, thank you, Jesus. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Uh, as we are up in the air, he's looking out the window. Uh, and you know, LaGuardia is right next to Rikers. Island. You know Rikers Island is the place where people die and people are starved and people are beaten and the whole time we're flying over Rikers Island, he's just saying thank you Jesus. Thank you Jesus. I said, okay brother, tell me why you're saying thank you Jesus. He said, you see Rikers Island down there? I was trapped there for six months for a crime I didn't commit but now I'm flying over what I used to be trapped in. Good evening y'all. But you ought to thank God uh, that you're flying over uh, what you used to be trapped in. Uh, will you look at your neighbor uh, and say, I'm over it. Uh, I'm over the regret. Uh, I'm over the heartache. Uh, I'm over the pain. Uh, I'm over the dysfunction. Uh, I'm over the abuse uh, because I just gave it one more week. Uh, will you look at your neighbor uh, and say, give it one more week. Uh, I'm look at your other neighbor uh, and say, one more week. One more week, one more week, uh, preach one more week, uh, apply one more week, uh, sing one more week, uh, dance one more week, uh, worship one more week, uh, kiss your family one more week, uh, because you're over it uh, if you just give it one more week. Uh, will somebody shout yes? I said shout yes, shout yes.